Thank you all for joining us. It is my absolute pleasure to be here with you today. And before we get started and recognizing that yesterday was Truth and Reconciliation Day, a day where we remember and recognize the atrocities and multi-generational effects of the Canadian residential school system here in Canada, uh, I do want to acknowledge that it is with profound respect that we acknowledge the privilege to be operating on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. We recognize the Indigenous people of Turtle Island who have been thriving on this land for centuries. And we also recognize Canada's history of colonization and ongoing violence against Indigenous peoples and their cultures. As guests of this land, we promise to walk gently and with respect. I'm honored to welcome you all today to today's Building Bridges event, part of our ongoing series by United for All, where we bring together diverse voices to foster understanding and unity in our country. This past year, we've been challenging, has been challenging for many of us. Our community, like so many others, have faced a rise in hate and discrimination, manifesting an increased incidence of anti-Semitism, anti-Palestinian racism, and Islamophobia. These events have tested our resilience, compassion, and commitment to standing up against hate in all its forms. United for All, a coalition of 40 organizations and individuals, has been working tirelessly to address these challenges by promoting dialogue, education, and community action. Through our collective efforts, we aim to build a community where everyone feels safe, respected regardless of their background or beliefs. As the backbone of the coalition, United Way has made it investments to support initiatives that foster collaboration and healing within our community. One of the examples of this work is the collaboration between Jewish Family Services and the Muslim Family Services of Ottawa, who have come together to support local communities in crisis. Their joint efforts have not only provided essential services, but have also sent a powerful message of solidarity and unity against hate and division. United Way East Ontario and par part of the coordinating team for United for All, thanks you all for joining us here today. I'll be moderating the conversation today. Let me get, so oh, I am so sorry, I've gone past. Thanks, Denise. So uh, straight, I'm right? moderating the conversation today. Yes. Uh, hello and welcome, everyone. My name is Cameron Ketchum. I'm a director of community initiatives here at United Way East Ontario and also part of the coordinating team for United for All. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, as Denise mentioned, I'll be moderating the conversation. Uh, and let me just start with some quick housekeeping. Uh, the chat function is on right now. We're going to close it during the main discussion, but we'll be opening it up again for uh, the Q&A period. If you have questions, we welcome them. Please submit them through the Q&A function and our team will be reviewing them and, and bringing them forward during the, during the Q&A. If there are similar ones, they may be combined, uh, but look out for those and then please do ask, uh, ask questions um, uh, during the event. We're here today to talk about how we as service providers, as neighbors, and as colleagues can help our communities navigate one of the more uh, visceral and bewildering challenges we've faced in recent years. Uh, the devastation in the Middle East has spurred discrimination and fear and division here in our region, and we know that engaging in dialogue on solutions can be fraught. Our guest experts have been navigating this challenge for years through academic, non-governmental, and international relations work, through public speaking and writing, and now through a sustained partnership that has seen them share their own experiences, achieving constructive dialogue with each other to help audiences do the same. Dr. Mira Sutrov is Professor of Political Science at Carleton University here in Ottawa. She is the author and co-editor of five books, most exploring Israeli-Palestinian justice and peace, including her latest, Borders and Belonging, a memoir. She has written op-ed pieces and appeared as a frequent commentator in all the media. 
She's a nine-time teaching award winner, including one of the uh, including of the highest university teaching award in Ontario. And she's joining us today from Jerusalem. Welcome, Mira. Omar Dajani is the Carol Olson Professor of International Law at McGeorge School of Law with the University of the Pacific and the son of a Palestinian refugee from Jaffa. Omar has served as a legal advisor in peace talks and summits at Camp David and Taba, uh, as a political officer with the UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, as a consultant on development and conflict resolution processes in the Middle East and elsewhere, He's published widely about law, conflict, and peace building in the Middle East, and is currently co-chair of A Land for All, a movement advocating for a two-state solution. Welcome, Omar. Thanks very much. Omar and Mira are currently writing a joint memoir on space, place, and emotion in Israel and Palestine, and developing a podcast on the past and future of Jaffa called The Vacant Lot, which I'm sure we'll hear more about in this discussion. So let's get started, shall we? Mira, we'll start with you. The audience here today is a mix of service providers, of program managers at uh, agencies that do frontline services, um, community developers, uh, people that work with communities who are who are challenged or who are suffering, and including those um, uh, that are feeling the impacts of the last year. What do you hope folks can get out of this session today? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for bringing all of us together, Cameron, and the rest of your team. And I've worked with some of you, if not you personally, then others in some of your organizations when I used to be active in uh, helping Canada bring in uh, Syrian and other refugees. And I know how important the work is that you do for uh, both newcomers and people already here, um, including Indigenous peoples who preceded all of us, all of me and refugees that I'm referring to. And I think what I hope is that people bring their questions and concerns and feel that this is a space where um, you can ask us about how to navigate the challenges before you and before all of us. And that will offer some, maybe some concrete suggestions and also um, by showing you all, sharing with you all some of the struggles we've each been through and how we navigate those with each other regarding uh, Jewish, Israeli and Palestinian, Arab Muslim dynamics more broadly in North America with the backdrop of the increasingly horrific situation over here in the region here because I happen to be in Jerusalem for a month and a half. Thanks. Yes. Awesome, thank you. Omar, feel free to, to share your own thoughts on what people want from today's session, but I also wanna ask, or maybe you can highlight how you and Mira came to start working together on, on these kinds of things. Sure, uh, well, uh, thanks for me as well for inviting us today. I'm really, really grateful for this. And um, I agree with what Mira said regarding what I hope you get out of it. I think one of the things that we have realized over this time is uh, that over this last year of incredible pain um, for um, uh, both Jews and Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims in North America, not to mention elsewhere, uh, there is a very broad feeling uh, that people don't feel heard and seen, um, that they feel that their uh, attitudes are misunderstood. Um, uh, uh, and and sometimes that the ways that they communicate are misunderstood. And so I hope that we can contribute in a small way to helping to um, name some of the things people are experiencing um, and to identify some of the ways in which we might, uh, without intending to hurt others with a view toward trying to uh, prevent that ha from happening or um, at least to ensure that when we engage with each other around difficult questions that it's constructive. Now, on, on that note, um, uh, Mira and I um, began engaging with each other right from the start in kind of a difficult difficult context. It was May of 2021. And as some of those in the audience may know, that was the period when the last uh, major armed confrontation between Israel and the Gaza Strip um, occurred prior to the uh, the current um, war horror uh, that's unfolding today and has been for the last year. And um, I was uh, uh, watching um, things unfold with increasing 
um, anxiety and anger and did what we so often do in those circumstances, which was post about it on Facebook uh, because I felt so lacking in other options in that moment. And, um, and so I wrote a long post about um, not only what was happening in the Gaza Strip at that juncture, but also about how the Gaza Strip came to be and, and how I related to it personally, how my family narrowly sort of avoided being among the Palestinians who have been trapped there for these for this last um, 75 years. And um, so I posted that and um, Mira, whom I had become Facebook friends with a few years earlier without us really being acquainted, we were in each other's professional networks, um, did this extraordinary thing of sharing it with folks in her uh, who follow her. And, um, and then did the even more extraordinary thing of engaging with those folks in a way that I found um, showed incredible solidarity. She engaged questions um, and answered them dispassionately. She took on the inevitable trolls um, and put them in their place. Um, and she directed some questions to me about things that she thought uh, that I might answer better. And I came away from it thinking, who is this person in a really good way, uh, which is uh, not always the way in which we engage with people on social media. And so um, over the next few months, we had kind of some light communication. Um, and uh, uh, by September of 2021, Mira reached out to me suggesting that we contemplate writing something together. And uh, we began a series of conversations that produced a few different projects uh, that we are still working on um, and uh, that have in the last year ended up being so much more complicated and interesting than I think either of us anticipated at the start. Wonderful, thank you for the background. Uh, and thanks to you both for the introductions. Um, Mira, as we were prepping for this conversation, you mentioned uh, that you were struck by a, a passage, I think, in the New York Times from last year um, that really sort of helps you orient yourself or frame how you're viewing what's what's unfolded over the over the past year, especially. Do you want to share that with us? Yeah, yes, thank you. It was an op-ed in the New York Times that was published last October, uh, October 25th. So almost three weeks after the attacks of October 7th and almost three weeks after Israel's assault on Gaza had begun. And I'm not going to tell you whether the writer was a Jew or a Palestinian, but it was some one of the two and they were in the United States, uh, they're American. And this is what they wrote. And I'm just going to say blank. And the blank is either Palestinian or Jew. And you can decide being uh, OK. I'm a poet, a writer, a psychologist. I'm deeply familiar with the importance of language. I pay attention to language, my own and others. Being blank in this country, in this case, the United States, being blank in this country, in many countries, is a numbing exercise engaging where pockets of safety are, sussing out which friends, coworkers, or acquaintances will be allies, which will stay silent, who will speak. And when I read that, it really struck me that it could have been written by either one. And I felt that, um, and yet I felt that, that that it wasn't obvious that it could have been written by either one, that this was my take. And I felt so certain about that because I'd seen similar uh, sentiments being stated by both communities that I just really wanted people to start thinking about um, that this could be a vehicle for empathizing because once we empathize that the other is in pain, I think that act of empathy, that act of radical compassion can right away serve to reduce the pain, at least here in North America. It won't necessarily reduce the pain of those who are under direct fire or who are whose family are being held hostage um, by Hamas, but it can help us here for starters. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, so you, you've talked about how you found each other uh, before October 7th, um, and you've engaged professionally and, and, and academically on, on, on the issues before and, and, and since, but how have, the, how have the events of October 7th and the ensuing war affected you personally, both 
within your respective communities and, and your own friendship with each other. Omar, do you want to start and we'll go to Mira next? Sure. I, I'd say two things. The first is uh, the way in which I, I'm going to sort of flip the question, if I may, uh, to start, Cameron, uh, which is the way in which our um, friendship and professional relationship changed the way I experienced October 7th. Uh, I had the opportunity, thanks to Mira, uh, the summer before October 7th, 2023, to go with her to the kibbutzim um, surrounding the Gaza Strip or that are in the area surrounding the Gaza Strip. I had never been in a kibbutz before, even though I'd been many, many, many times to Israel, Palestine and lived there for some time, as you mentioned. And um, it was a rich, if sometimes disconcerting experience for me. But what made it a really important experience in a range of ways was getting to know the folks who Mira refers to as her kibbutz parents or kibbutz family, people who, you know, uh, were there for her during periods when she uh, lived in Israel and was studying and, uh, and needed a family. Um, and, um, and we had, they were incredibly generous during my time there. They showed me around. We had some difficult conversations. We uh, looked at some places that for both sets of people, raised some difficult things. Um, and I left um, feeling grateful to have met them and um, uh, to have seen the side of, of Mira's life, but that, um, and, and a side of Israeli life I didn't know. But that took on all the greater significance on October 7th because, you know, they were, um, um, the, their kibbutz was among those that was attacked by Hamas. Um, they were uh, literally um, uh, meters from being murdered. Um, and and uh, uh, there were uh, uh, Hamas um, uh, assailants literally outside of their house. And uh, they uh, were in their uh, safe room. And um, uh, we later would hear a kind of a blow by blow of what occurred uh, that day that their lives were just barely saved but even without knowing that on october 7th when the news started to filter through of what had happened and mira and i happened to be um, on the verge of giving a talk in new york and so we were uh, in the same place i um heard the news i think in a way that was fundamentally different than i otherwise would have um there wasn't the same psychological distance. Um, it wasn't just some Israelis who were under attack. And of course, I was still thinking, what, what are the consequences going to be for Palestinians? I confess that the tribal piece didn't leave me in that moment, um, but, um, but uh, I couldn't see what had just occurred uh, in, in a clinical way that I might otherwise have. And I would say that in the months since, as we have grappled with all that's unfolded, um, there have been periods and, and episodes during which I think having, like processing all of this with someone from the other community has been incredibly illuminating for me. It's, it's enabled me to see things that I wouldn't otherwise um, have seen, uh, to have uh, read news stories differently, to have been to parse expressions. And I know we're gonna talk a little bit about this later on, um, uh, that I hear one way and that Mira or others in her community hear another. Um, but it's also meant that um, a relationship that had been largely unmarred by uh, conflict, um, uh, got exposed to some. And I think one of the things she and I have struggled with is that even though we have relatively similar political commitments, pl similar visions for the future, which we'll also talk about later, we come from very different experiences and, and backgrounds and grappling with how those produce different reactions to the news cycle has been challenging. And I, you know, have sometimes been infuriated with Mira, and I have sometimes emerged from those situations thoroughly embarrassed by my own behavior. Mira? 
Yeah, I want to just pick up on something Omar said about uh, that he alluded to really briefly. So when October 7th was had happened, when the attacks had happened, and we were still trying to process the news, our host at Rutgers University called us to say, we know you're giving a talk tomorrow, but you can change it as you wish. And she, one of the things she said to Omar was, what are you hearing from your, um, your friends and colleagues back in Palestine? And Omar said, they're worried. And I didn't say this at the time, just because there was so much going on and we were working hard to process, but my thought was, wait a second, that's what they think? They're worried? What about they're not empathizing or sympathizing at least with the, the pain and, and um, shock and horror of Israelis who have been murdered, raped, kidnapped, on and on and on. And then fast forward nearly a year and I'm here in Jerusalem and Israel has engaged in the beeper attack. So that, so we think, of course, they didn't fully take responsibility, but they didn't deny it. So we're assuming that, that it was them and um, innocents were killed. And I was about to do a CBC interview on the radio and the interviewer asked me, what are people here feeling, Mira, where you are in Jerusalem? And I said, they're worried. And I realized that is a very, very natural response. And yet we we sometimes may expect too much of the other. And that was a real, uh, and it was like that later that night, I was able to realize that I had done the exact same thing that I had secretly blamed Omar for doing. And so it's really, but it's constantly a dance. It doesn't mean, neither does that mean that it's the end of it. It doesn't mean we should only be worried for our side, but it means we should, I guess, act with grace, realizing that people are pulled in many, many different directions. Um, just in terms of the last thing I'll say is, um, one thing I noticed that happens with Omar and I, and the reason I think we're going into this in so much detail is we're hoping that this, well, we're not hoping that you all have tensions like this in your lives, but we're hoping that you all have the opportunity to have meaningful and sometimes tough conversations with people who are outside your community, because that is ultimately what's going to bring, I think, Canadians closer together. And some one thing we do notice is that sometimes when we're with our own community separately, um, we will push back against some of the norms of our own community and try to pull people more towards sympathy with the other. And when we're with each other, when Omar and I are alone with each other, we sometimes do the exact opposite. I mean, I can psychoanalyze this and say it's because my parents were divorced and I was trying to pull the pieces together. But Omar came from a very intact, loving um, parent. Uh, his parents were had a very loving marriage. So my uh, my uh, conclusions fall short. So I'll have to go down another psychological road at another opportunity. But the point is, I think it isn't um, entirely surprising that we play different roles in different contexts because the cognitive dissonance can be very um, distressing. Thanks for, thanks for that, both of you. Um, so let's explore the last year um, a little bit more deeply. Um, Omar, you've been in, in in rooms where peace negotiations have been have been happening. Why has it been so difficult to achieve a ceasefire, to achieve the release of hostages and prisoners and achieve steps towards genuine peace in this past year? It's a it's a good and uh, albeit a very, very big question. So I, I will um, maybe make one uh, opening point and then uh, offer a couple of thoughts. Uh, or examples rather. The opening point is that, of course, as we look at this last year, there are all these different um, perspectives about um, why things are unfolding as they're unfolding, not only between these two communities that we each represent, but within them. And so uh, we've got to recognize that one of the challenges that we face as folks a varying distance from events is parsing through these narratives and trying to think about them critically. And so I think that um, if we uh, look at these last few months um, uh, as, as one sort of period in time, um, the period following the United Nations Security Council, finally um, in early June issuing a resolution uh, calling for a ceasefire and wondering, okay, this is a point at which um, there is a um, uh, an authoritative statement by uh, the Security Council demanding that this occur 
why has it not happened um, in that period? And I think there are a few different ways of understanding what's going on. I'd say many uh, Palestinians and some Israelis whom I talk to say, well, um, the Israeli government from the start has not wanted a ceasefire. Um, the Israeli government has sought from the start uh, to at minimum see Hamas not only as a military uh, or a terrorist um, uh, organization, but also Hamas as a political organization destroyed in the Gaza Strip, uh, rendered incapable of acting um, in that space, um, and also neutered in other parts of the uh, in the Middle East, and including in, in the West Bank. Um, there, there are some who would go a step further and say, um, yes, that is a part of what Israel is seeking in these circumstances. But um, uh, when you look at the rhetoric of some of the uh, actors within Netanyahu's governing coalition, what you see is a demand um, for uh, ethnic cleansing for Palestinians to be pushed out of the Gaza Strip and for the Gaza Strip to be opened up once again to Jewish settlement. Now, um, there is potentially a difference within the Israeli government regarding those issues and certainly within different factions uh, within the government. They see the relative merits of those questions differently, but those are parts of it. You may also just hear folks saying, hey, the re main reason... Um, that uh, we haven't seen a ceasefire so far. Um, and I have heard this from a lot of Israeli actors is because um, the uh, uh, Hamas wants this conflict um, to, or at least wanted, I don't know if that would be true at this, at this juncture, but wanted this conflict to uh, continue until a point where Israel feels that it has that its bargaining position has changed, uh, where Israel feels obliged to act differently vis-a-vis -vis, um, the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Um, and, uh, and they'll say, um, we, uh, we don't see any real desire on the part of Hamas, um, which they say would be evidenced by an unconditional release of hostages uh, to move forward. Um, and so I, I think that there are different ways that we can understand. I, I confess that for me, I think that while early on um, uh, there was uh, to some extent a, uh, a, a way in which both um, Hamas and the Israeli government uh, were um, entrenched in seeing this thing uh, uh, continue forward, um, my own sense is that uh, we've gotten to a place where the continuing um, hostilities are to a great extent a consequence of the fact that the Israeli government is not reconciled to um, having any role for Hamas in the Gaza Strip whatsoever in the period to come. Um, and the Gaza and that Hamas is not prepared to consent to its elimination as a, as a basis for going forward. But I'm interested in hearing what Mira's take on that might be. Go ahead, Mira. It's hard for me to disagree with much that Omar said. I think a lot of it is, I mean, in the case of Israel, a lot of it comes down to domestic politics and Bibi Netanyahu's base and the fact that his polling has only gone up recently as he's continued the war um, and shifted it to a second front in a more intensive way. Um, so a lot of it is sometimes the government, you know, sometimes domestic politics and the fact that Israelis are generally supportive of what they see is what is, many Israelis see is the continued elimination of what they think of as an existential threat. And so this gets right to the question of even the term, a term like genocide. Later, we're going to unpack terms. And I don't know if we have time to go into really the international law around it, but just to get to the discourse aspect, when Israelis and many Jews, the mainstream, let's say the mainstream Jewish community in Ottawa, since this is taking place in Ottawa mostly, hears um, people accuse Israel of being genocidal, they will say, well, it's Hamas that's genocidal. Hamas is the one that's trying to, that would have just killed more and more and more and more and more Israelis had they not been eventually stopped by a very, very late coming 
uh, IDF that day, and Hezbollah just wants to keep killing more and more uh, Israelis if their missiles were more uh, precise, and not to mention the, Houth the Houthis over in Yemen. And so there's a sense of who is really who really wants to kill who, and who is acting in self defense. And th this is a big part of what I think our communities here in Ottawa are really struggling with is these different um, perceptions of who is trying to survive and who is um, is trying to harm. And I think one, one of the things that uh, we noted early on and that I think was a big part of the argument was that the word context suddenly became controversial um, because context, the word context spoke to the point at which you began your discussion, right? The point at which uh, uh, you suggested uh, the story began, the conflict began. And um, and so one of the things that, you know, we've struggled with is we've undertaken to tell the story of our own experiences um, and to analyze particular events is to think about the starting point. And, um, and you know, I think one of the things that uh, for, uh, Palestinians and Jews, each in relation to different historical events, that people tend to, to really uh, disagree about is when we begin uh, telling the story. Yeah, no, thank you. So this is really helpful um, insight, professional insights into, into the last um, the last year and, and, and what some of the challenges are. I know for many of us in local communities, and this is from a United Way perspective as well, that is a lot. That is a lot to try and influence. That is a lot to try and understand. And sometimes it seems impossible to, to be able to um, move uh, those processes uh, at all, uh, have an impact on global peace processes. So we've looked inwards and we've we've made a you know a conscious decision to like the one thing we can do is to try and support. Um, our communities and and to address the impact that this is having locally. Um, so again, this is a big question, but how can we do that better? How can we be better allies to communities in pain? Palestinians, Arabs, Muslims, Jews. Mira. Well, I think it really goes at two levels. One is what we can do for communities themselves. And the other is the kinds of um, conversations and programming we may want to have and get them to get these communities to think and talk about. So at the level of communities themselves, it really entails listening and hearing to pain and fear and urging people to talk in terms of pain and fear and legitimize that because insofar someone insofar that someone is feeling sorry you're actually gonna literally this is like i think the first time i've actually cried on a webinar and i've done many but it's because i actually am for the first time feeling very scared about iran it's happening right now and not not nothing's happening so for those of you who have friends and family where i am in the middle east or israel palestine it's not happening but the headlines are happening and i'm actually feeling very scared now, if I were to share that and say I'm feeling scared, if someone were to, resp were to respond and say Israel started it, if Israel hadn't done the beepers, if Israel in you know, 1948 and Nakba, that's not the right, um, so I'm using myself right as a case study as to how to help others help others in, com in their community, that's not the right moment for that conversation. The right moment, the, what's right for that moment is to hold the person in pain. I'm going to put it over to Omar, Omar and then I'm going to come back and continue once I've collected myself and finish my thought. Thank you, Mira. Omar? Sure. Um, well, I, I, I will um, maybe start by talking about the, uh, the individual piece. And um, I, I, I may anticipate a, a question that I think you were uh, intending to get to in a moment, Cameron. Um, which I think might help to uh, make sense of what we're grappling with here. When I um, think about the communities of which I'm part, um, Palestinian, um, uh, Muslim and Christian, um, uh, Arab, and, um, and, and even among um, progressives who aren't necessarily from one of those groups, but that are deeply engaged in watching uh, what is unfolding. I 
I think that there is um, not only uh, ongoing grief, um, deep anguish that people feel when they're uh, looking at what is happening on their Twitter feed in the morning, um, uh, not only uh, anger directed potentially at, um, at Israel or for that matter at Hamas. I know plenty of Palestinians who also felt uh, very, very uh, uh, angry about the position that Hamas placed Palestinians in, not to mention what Hamas did on October 7th, but also a kind of uh, helpless rage directed toward Western institutions for their complicity, um, rage toward a media that people felt didn't tell uh, their stories well. Um, and so there could very often be a kind of silent simmering. Um, and, and as a consequence, I, I find myself coming back to advice that Mira gave, which um, I think is such important advice and advice that I and advice I would take if she and I were in the same room right now in view of what she's struggling with, um, uh, the, 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 the real fear and the, the reality that she's struggling, which was when um, confronted with a colleague who has a connection um, to start with an open-ended question, like, how are you doing? Um, and to uh, be prepared to engage emotionally with that person uh, to try to provide um, emotional support for that person in this moment of rage and anguish and maybe even a feeling of betrayal, understanding that these things are complicated. And um, if I can take the point that Mira was starting to make just one step further, you know, one of the things that we have found is that um, right after something incredibly hard occurs, it's really, really difficult uh, to fully flesh out uh, what what we're grappling with. Um, and so if you take, for example, um, October 7th itself and its effect on Mira's kibbutz family, um, she and I were able to go there a few weeks ago and, and sit with them. And we had we heard all about what their experience was. And then at the end, we were able to actually talk for a little while about um, about what they understood the broader political context was and what Gazans are experiencing. And that was hard even in that moment, but it would have been impossible um, a week after or a month after, or maybe even six months after it occurred during the time when they were still displaced from their home, for example. And, and I think that um, we have to learn to give uh, folks in our space, in our communities, a bit of grace um, to, as Mira suggested to me and to others, to ask them how they are and to and to be there for them with an understanding that you're making an investment in a, hard, in a conversation that you can have down the line. Um, but you've got to build an emotional connection sometimes for that conversation to be one in which both parties can hear each other. Lovely. Yeah, thanks. Mira, do you want to do you want? Yeah, to... thanks. I would say, I guess something else I'm thinking about is how to read and how to interpret the solidarities of others. So um, there are times when um, I'm trying to think here in Israel, if you um, if you want to press for hostage release, you go on Saturday night and rally in Tel Aviv with tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of other Israelis who are pleading with their government, with Bibi Netanyahu to see what they call it, seal the deal, sign a deal. So fighting for hostage rights here has become um, a collective effort against by Jewish Israelis for the most part against their own government. Many of those Israelis wear shirts, wear yellow ribbons, they wear, um, dog tags, which Israelis call a, a diskit with um, phrase release the hostages. If you see a dog tag like that saying release the hostages in Ottawa, you may, one may interpret that as being somehow anti-Palestinian. And I would say we need to start stripping away the assumptions 
that um, fighting for the freedom of one group means denying the freedom of others without knowing the intentions of the person wearing that tag. Similarly, a kafia, which is a Palestinian uh, cultural symbol, it's become a symbol of liberation. Similarly, the watermelon, which is a uh, it's yellow green uh, or yellow pink or not yellow, uh, red, green, white, and black, and it mimics the colors of the Palestinian flag back when the Israeli military and the Israeli government used to outlaw the, the, the uh, Palestinian flag or even graffiti using those colors in during the uh, first intifada, the first Palestinian uprising in the late 80s. If someone walks around with a Palestine with a watermelon, does that mean that they're necessarily saying that Jews or Jewish Israelis should be harmed? Not necessarily. So I think we need to honor each other's pain and solidarity. That's what that's the sort of at the micro level in terms of interpersonal interpretation of the codes and the signs and the symbols that many people in our community are putting out there. The next thing we need to do, and this is more at the macro level, is we need to make communities aware of what I think of as the ecosystem of Israel, Palestine, peace, justice, and equality groups. Omar is co-chair of one that I'm also active in called the Land for All. And I think towards the end of the chat, Omar will share a bit more on that. There's a land for all, there's combatants for peace, there's standing together, um, seeds for peace, um, parent circle forum. There are many groups that are fighting, working together, bringing Israelis and Palestinians together to, to work towards a different future, one where people's pain and suffering and freedom on, on the negative side and freedom and dignity and equality on the positive side are not viewed as mutually exclusive. So I think knowing that those groups exist and being able to toggle back and forth between thinking what's happening over there in Israel, Palestine, where people are not enough people, but there are people and groups working towards that. How can we import that sentiment back into our communities here, where sometimes the conversation feels unnecessarily and tragically zero sum? Thank you both. Um, I, did, I, I feel it's important to acknowledge you mentioned the situation's evolving quickly, Mira. Um, the last few weeks, Lebanon has become involved. There's a big Lebanese community in Ottawa. I, I, I don't have a question about that, except let's let's assume we're all also um, including um, folks from the Lebanese community, the same sort of spirit of engagement. Um, I think people on the call, uh, I know, are, are, are figuring out how to how to engage with additional communities that are now um, being implicated in this uh, as well. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as we move forward as well. Um, so we've talked a bit about this, but uh, I think one of the one of the big challenges um, in engaging and having conversations um, around this issue has been language and, and how to use it, uh, what to how to be confident in, in talking about um, these issues. Omar, the last um, 10 months have, have stirred for Palestinians and, and other Arabs and Muslims here in North America. Um, uh, fear and, and, and challenges, particularly in relation to um, experiences of anti-Palestinian racism, anti-Arab racism, Islamophobia. Can you help us understand that um, a little better? Sure. Um, so I think that there is a um, there is a set of words that people understand to be racist, and every racial or ethnic group has those words. And we know that when those words are used, uh, that they hurt, and very often are calculated to hurt. And I won't go through those words. I think people can fill in the blank and uh, uh, anticipate uh, what they are. And I would hope would know better to you than to use them. Um, but while I confess that I am, um, I teach constitutional law among other things in, in law school, um, and am a bit of a of from a U.S. perspective a First Amendment purist, which is being, which means that I'm a strong believer in in freedom of speech as a as a as a framework, and we have a different approach to hate speech than you do in Canada. And I say all of that because I think it's important to distinguish between the sorts of things that should be censured or prohibited and the sorts of things that should 
people should hesitate to do because they hurt others. And I think that that's an important line to be mindful of. And so not everything I'm going to say is something that I would suggest should guide organizational um, frameworks, should guide rules about ground rules about the kinds of things people are permitted to say or not um, in a workplace. Um, I would probably be more, uh, allow more liberty, even if it's hurtful than some others would. But having said that, I think that there is a, um, uh, uh, in some respects, Amira, I think will probably elaborate on the parallels. There, there are a, a lot of similarities between some of the kinds of things that, um, uh, are experienced by both Palestinians and Jews is frustrating. I'll start off by talking about some ways in which uh, stereotypes, some stereotypes are unique to Muslims, Arabs, and Palestinians, and then maybe speak as a transition to what Mira might say later about where there are some parallels. And so I think during this period, especially, um, it has been uh, painful for old stereotypes of Arabs, Muslims, Palestinians as being inherently violent, um, as being um, uh, uh, less respectful of life in general, less committed to the lives of their children, um, uh, of being um, inherently anti-Semitic, of being intolerant, um, of being uh, particularly deserving of scrutiny um, of being um, oppressive toward women or towards uh, sexual minorities. Um, and um, as a consequence, um, in need more broadly of, of discipline or correction because of those kinds of attitudes. I think all of those kind of statements that uh, sort of uh, engage those sorts of tropes are hurtful at any time, but they're particularly hurtful during a time in which folks in these communities feel victimized, um, feel uh, incredibly vulnerable, and feel that um, uh, these tropes represent the opposite of reality. They're being accused of violence or of being violent when violence is being visited upon them. Um, uh, they're being accused of being dismissive of rights uh, when their own rights are being marginalized. And that's true with respect to expressive freedoms as well. And so I think that one of the things that we've got to be really careful about is always avoiding circumstances where we attribute to the group um, uh, actions of some of its members. And that's true, whatever group we're talking about. That, to my mind, is the very definition of racism. When we generalize from uh, some of these um, individual actions or even from patterns to include everyone in the group. But um, even when we are um, engaging in discussions uh, with folks from the other side, to be mindful of how embedded some of these tropes are in our discourse and to actively resist um, using them uh, to, uh, 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 to, to recognize how much they can hurt and to try to try to adjust them. The one, one of the ways in which I think there's some real similarity, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop and let, and, uh, maybe let, let you turn to Mira, um, is that I think also for, uh, uh, Arabs and for Palestinians in particular, and I'll speak about Palestinians here, um, there is a strong sense that the Palestinian narrative is, is very often erased, um, that, the idea that Palestinians are a people um, is something that we see folks in public life challenging regularly um, and saying things in private life uh, that would uh, push forward that, uh, that way of thinking. Um, we see denial of some of the uh, past events in Palestinian history. Uh, for example, the Nakba, which is um, uh, the Arabic word for catastrophe, which Palestinians, when they use it, are referring to um, the period between 1948 and 1950 when some 750,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled from their homes in what's now Israel and not allowed to return, but also when uh, Palestine ceased to exist as a um, um, uh, 
political community um, of Palestinians in their homeland, um, not to be recreated for some time to come. And so this defining moment in Palestinian history is very often marginalized um, or even treated as something that you're not allowed to talk about, something that is um, anti-Semitic to raise. And I think for many Palestinians, that kind of erasure is um, uh, uh, brutally painful uh, to experience. And there are analogs, as I think Mira might get to, uh, when we think about Jewish experience on that front. Yeah, no, thank you. And Mira, do you want to, do you want to? Mm -hmm. I think a really uh, big issue right now is assuming or uh, blaming Jews as Jews for the actions of Israel, blaming Jews in Canada, for example, for, uh, for the actions in it for the actions of Israel. And so spray painting a synagogue with even the word, well, of course, with a swastika, but even spray painting the term free Palestine, which in and of itself, the term free Palestine is not anti-Semitic on its own or should not be viewed as anti-Semitic on its face. If spray painted on a synagogue would be, an, in my view, an act of anti-Semitism because it's assuming that Jews as Jews should be responsible for the actions of Israel, Jews in Canada. Um, there are all sorts of anti-Semitic tropes. What, folks can look those up. Um, outsized Jewish control, Jews controlling the media, Jews controlling Hollywood, um, uh, Jews being cheap, things like, things like that that are probably largely familiar to most of you. And then there are debates right now, big debates, over whether a definition of anti-Semitism should be codified and used in particular workplace situations. The one you may know the, be the best is the IHRA definition, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition, which has been adopted by Canada and I believe Ontario and many other countries, but which organizations are debating right now. And I know there's big debates at universities as to whether it should or shouldn't be adopted. There's two alternate definitions that I'm personally involved in, full disclosure. One is the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. I'll put these three things in the chat and those of you can, and uh, folk, the host of panelists can maybe let others know later. The Jerusalem Declaration of Anti-Semitism, the Nexus document, and those are both um, alternatives to the IHRA and I'm the founding signatory of the JDA and I'm on the advisory council of Nexus. And the basic difference between, in this debate between anti-Semitism definitions is the degree to which anti-Zionism is understood to be um, necessarily a form of anti-Semitism. The IHRA brings anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism very close together in its definition. The other definitions keep it much farther apart. And that's the basic definition. And that, is this a good time for me to just share, how much time do we have till we're gonna open up for questions? We've got a good 20, 20 minutes or right. so. So maybe is this a good time for me to share a little bit of work I did on understanding what Zionism means to Jews? Please. Yeah, go okay, ahead. Like segue. Okay, so I ran a survey. The survey was of American Jews, not Canadian Jews, unfortunately. But I'm quite sure from my knowledge of the Jewish community in Canada, I'm quite sure that what you're going to hear translates roughly over to the Canadian context. I asked American Jews, this was two and a half years ago, I asked American Jews, are you a Zionist? 58% said yes. 58% said they were a Zionist. Then I said, I'm going to give you a definition of Zionism. Zionism means the belief in a Jewish and democratic state. Are you a Zionist? The number went up from 58 to 71. Then I asked everyone, uh, then I asked the, the survey respondents again, I'm going to give you another definition. Definition, a Zionism means an emotional attachment to Israel. Are you a Zionist? Again, 71, 72% said they were. And then I gave them another definition. And this is the definition I didn't say where I got it or why I was saying it. I just gave it to them. But I will let you all know that this was the definition that anti-Zionists think of when they think of Zionism. And especially Palestinians who have been on the receiving end of the um, major, major uh, oppressive aspects of Zionism vis-a-vis -vis Palestinians from um, prior, well prior to 1948 until now. So I said... I'm going to give you a final definition. Zionism means the privileging of Jews over non-Jews in Israel. It means the privileging of Jews over non-Jews in Israel. Are you a Zionist? Only 10% at this point said they were. In other words, 
what even is anti-Zionism and what even is Zionism? People understand the term so differently. And so that's, I think, something else we really need to think about when we're uh, dealing in community spaces, because one person's Zionism is not necessarily another person's Zionism. Omar, anything to add? No, no, I, 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 we may circle back to that, but no, no, that's great. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for that insight into into the, the survey as well, Mayor. So this is great. Um, I think it's 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 really important to start to unpack some some of this language uh, and what we're hearing and what's uh, what it means. Um, some some other phrases that might be understood differently across populations: from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. Globalize the infantata. There are others. Can you help us? unpack those uh, and and the, that kind of that kind of sentiment Mira yes Omar and I have spent a lot of time probably more than either of us would have liked over the years not because of uh, questions like these which were we we do love unpacking but when we're left to our own devices sometimes we end up rehashing things more often than we would like when we're alone is what I mean so I, when, when, I mean, there has been a lot of buzz uh, regarding the campus protests and elsewhere about the phrase from the river to the sea, Palestine shall be free. I, I, I love doing these kinds of surveys, as you can see, and I lean on my graduate students who have uh, wonderful quantitative skills that I lack, but I did a, a very informal one on Facebook about six months ago, and I asked uh, Jews on my Facebook, my broad Facebook network, if you use the phrase, what do you mean by it? If you don't use the phrase and find it threatening, what, how do you feel? Or maybe I did, may not have even said if you find it threatening. If you don't use the phrase, how do you feel when you hear it? And many, many Jews who replied on my informal, this is an informal unscientific survey, said they hear it as a call for ethnic cleansing or as a call for genocide. I, um, I don't see it that way, and, um, but I can understand the fear. I also think it's suitably ambiguous whereby it can be understood in different ways. Um, I also understand that there is possibly a different uh, version of it when it's said in Arabic. Maybe Omar can unpack that for us. In any event, there's a lot of um, mutual fear that when one side says something, it means the annihilation of the other. We can just think about the, the necklaces. There is a single pendant that both sides wear, minus the little extra nub that represents the Golan Heights. Palestinians don't wear that pendant. But aside from the little nub that represents the Golan Heights, many Jews wear a pendant with the entire land of Israel, including the West Bank, including Gaza, on it. Many Palestinians wear a pendant with what they would see as the entire land of Palestine, including the West Bank, including Gaza, and including what is known as Israel proper on it. Um, does that mean that both sides seek the annihilation of the other? Or does that mean that both sides are simply being uh, signaling uh, connectivity and attachment and solidarity with their brethren who live in that those places? Um, and there's yet a third option. It could mean that each side thinks that the side with more power or one side think or others might think that the side with more power is signaling the annihilation of the other because um, only one side has a major military and only one side can truly annihilate the other. That said, um, many Israelis and many Jews, as I said, feel that Hamas wanted to annihilate them and would have continued to do that had they not been stopped. So maybe I'll, I'll um, uh, say two things about the river to the sea uh, point. Um, I think that uh, for, you know, what Mira laid out is some of the apprehensions that are felt by folks about that phrase. I think that um, for the folks I know who use it, um, and I have used it uh, before, uh, that it's not a reference to the Jewish people at all, um, that it is a reference to the different systems of injustice that are experienced in all across of all across um, what was historical Palestine, which includes um, Israel and Palestine. And so it's a way of saying 
we see the ways in which Gazans are unfree. We see the way in which Palestinians in the West Bank are unfree. We see the way in which Palestinians in East Jerusalem are unfree. And we see the ways in which Palestinians who are citizens of Israel are unfree. Each one of those groups has different rights. Each one of those groups has different degrees of unfreedom. And what we seek is freedom for all. Now, to Mira's point, is that the way that everyone means the phrase when they chant it? Um, I don't know. I can't imagine that it is. I'm sure that there's some who have different have different feelings uh, about it. I think that my my very unscientific um, assessment is that among those I know um, who uh, attend events of this kind, that that's what their focus is. It's on Palestinian freedom, not um, on genocide against anyone. Um, and I think um, people would blanch at the idea that genocide or ethnic cleansing is, is uh, would ever be seriously contemplated by them. But that brings me to the second point, which is that um, whatever we may wish, uh, the things that we say may be heard by others in ways that we don't want them to be heard, uh, may be understood by others in ways that we wish they weren't understood. And so the question then becomes, how do we respond to that situation? What do we do? Um, and, you know, some some will say, as the U.S. Congress has tried to, then stop using the phrase. Um, and, and that's an unsatisfying answer uh, for folks who... Um, for the reasons I laid out earlier, say, hey, this is a, a, um, a chant about Palestinian freedom. Stop constraining our ability to advocate for our rights. Um, and there are others uh, who would say uh, to Jews, oh, you know, just get a grip. It's not like uh, genocide is really imminent for the power uh, in light of the power dynamics that Mira laid out. Um, and I uh, I think that that's an equally unsatisfying response. I think the approach in the middle, which may sound um, frustratingly moderate to some folks, um, is to always in these circumstances, in these circumstances, go for more speech uh, rather than enforced silence. To um, try to uh, be clear about what you mean, um, you know. Uh, uh, Mira has at times suggested, uh, as as uh, have other uh, leading scholars saying, from the river to the sea, Palestinians will be free. Um, but even if you choose to use the original slogan to undertake to reassure your Jewish audience about um, the fact that you are committed to their safety and security as well, um, there's, there's so little the, the cost in that. I know that sometimes people feel a psychological burden. Like even now I have to reassure them, even in these circumstances, is that really my role? Is that my responsibility in light of all the power that Israel has in that space or that pro-Israel, uh, the pro-Israel lobby in our countries may have? And, and I think it all comes back to this question of, you know, how serious we are about trying to effect transformation. And, uh, recognizing that persuasion is only partially and maybe not even mostly a rational enterprise, uh, that it is to such a great extent an emotional one. Um, and actually ensuring that people get the message you intend um, seems, um, uh, offering more speech seems like a small price to pay for ensuring that people actually hear the message that you intend in their hearts as well as um, in, in, uh, with their heads. Well, thank you for taking us through some of that. Um, it, you know, it is it is complicated. And I think for, for many people sort of working with communities and, and, and the spaces we work in, it, it's it's partly you know wanting to make sure we understand the the, the context and the and the nuances. Um, but it's also partly just I I, I want to know what to say that um, doesn't maybe unpack everything uh, all the time. You know, the anniversary of October seventh is coming up next week. Uh, we've we've had conversations uh, with with folks in the community about like what do we, what is the best way to to honor that moment, to commemorate it, to acknowledge it. Um, it, it, does it does it make a difference to do something publicly or not? 
do you have some thoughts, some some ideas, some guidance you can you can offer people, organizations, uh, uh, and others in Ottawa? So I'll start with Mira. Sure. I think that it's really important to remember that October 7th, and actually now, Omar, you can remind me, when did Israel start bombing Gaza on the 8th? 7th, 8th, or 9th? I had thought it was the 8th. It turns out, I think it was technically the 7th. Okay. So that helps me in my answer then. To remember that October 7th is the anniversary of two horrible things. It's the anniversary of the Hamas attacks on Israel in which 800 civilians died. And it's the anniversary of Israel's assault on Gaza, which has led to the deaths of over 41,000. We don't know how many of those are civilians um, versus militants, but we can imagine, uh, we can presume that many are civilians. Now, the other thing I would say is I think it's really important to use the language of compassion, which means center, and here's, this is what the young people say, right, use center as a verb, to center or make central, the um, terms of those who are hurting. And so I wouldn't personally, this is, and, and again, Omar was talking about what speech to not legislate or legislate, and I, I'm, I'm not, I'm agreeing with him that we're not talking about what should be made illegal. This isn't, this is a best practice. We're giving best practice um, suggestions for workplace communication, not making claims about what should be outlawed or right, or even workplace policies as to who should be disciplined. We're just talking about best practices for getting along with your colleagues and for speaking compassionately. So it's at that level. Um, I wouldn't call it uh, the anniversary of the Al-Aqsa flood because that is the language of the perpetrators. And I wouldn't call it, I don't actually, I've for, now I've forgotten because of all this tension I'm under right now. Actually, I, I would have forgotten anyway, even if Iran wasn't threatening to blow the missiles right my way. What does, is Israel calling the, um, Omar, do you remember? Does Israel, how does Israel even have a name for this operation? It's not even used a lot. I don't think. Anyway. I haven't used, heard it used much. Yeah, yeah, it's not used the way the, the 2021 and 2014 and 08, 09 operations used to have a name that were used. Um, so whatever, so I wouldn't, I would uh, center Palestinian um, um, pain and suffering in terms of thinking about this these massive losses and displacement of the last year in Gaza. And I would center um, Israeli losses and pain in terms of the attacks on Israel. Um, and also, Cameron, thank you for keeping reminding us about Lebanon. And and even two people who've been killed in Lebanon, civilians, are Canadian citizens. So yes, Cameron, you're absolutely right that we need to remember about our Lebanese friends and family. It's a lot more complex there politically because of the internal um, political divisions between ethnic groups in Lebanon and Hezbollah represents one slice of one ethnic group. And so it's a lot more complex than um, on its not that the Palestinian politics are not complex, but there's a lot more moving parts and the people of Lebanon and the people of Israel don't necessarily have um, claims one on the other. It's really an Israel Hezbollah conflict where Lebanese civilians are getting caught up in it. I don't know, Omar, if you agree with that sort of quick crude take versus but um, mostly because the Lebanese people are not under Israeli military occupation, the way uh, West Bank and Gaza are, Gaza is a comp little bit more complex because it was a blockade, not a ground occupation since 05, nevertheless. Um, where did I go with that? To center the pain and suffering of each and that it's an important one year anniversary for many people. And, um, you know, I, I see there is so much hatred um, around me living in Jerusalem for six weeks. I'm here to work on my Arabic, um, actually, because my Hebrew, I'm getting a lot of Hebrew, but my Hebrew was always, already very, very good. And, but, and there's a lot of hatred um, around me, but there are occasionally these flashes of hope of stickers. There's a lot, Israelis have for many, many decades been really into political slogans as bumper stickers and stickers on walls. 
and lampposts. And one of the things I've seen, a couple of things I've seen are a play on Together We Will Win, which is has become a military slogan and a nationalist slogan to uh, further the war effort. But there's a there's a, a new take on it. And it has uh, half, a, half of it's a kafia, half of it's a Star of David, half of it's in Arabic, half of it's in Hebrew with the Arabic and Hebrew crisscrossed over the respective symbols. And it says to, in Hebrew and Arabic, together we will win meaning we are all in this together we can only truly win whatever winning is whatever victory is victory would mean peace equality safety for all if we come together and so wouldn't it be amazing if in ottawa we could think about coming together and saying what does everybody need a year after these horrible horrible events that are still ongoing they're still ongoing because while hamas isn't hamas is sending the occasional rocket into israel but not much while Israelis are not being attacked in their homes right now, there still are 101 Israeli hostages being held by Hamas. And there still are Gaza, Palestinians in Gaza being attacked by Israeli rocket fire. And there still are Lebanese civilians fleeing for safety. And, um, and there still are thousands, tens of thousands and thousands and thousands of people on both sides of the border displaced. So the, the, the terror, the terrorized situation is still ongoing. And can we come together and try to think of a different future together? Yvonne Omar? So I think that, um, I, I think this is a, it's a hard question how to mark this milestone. I think it's, um, I, I, I think organizations that are um, thinking through it have to understand that, that you are walking into a, a minefield in some respects, which isn't a reason not to try. Indeed, I think not to try would, would, could hurt, but, um, but I think that there are a few things to bear in mind. So I just want to stress a, a, a few of them. The first is just to drive home the point that Mira right, made right at the end, which is that this is not over. This is not a past thing that we are marking. Um, this is continuing. And for the community, for your, the communities that you're working with, um, it is very real every single morning. And it's, you know, to have now a feed both from um, you know, not only southern Lebanon, but from from Beirut of these terrible images, as well as from uh, Gaza, um, it really takes a toll. And of course, um, now there are renewed anxieties for for uh, Israelis of a different type, even than than they've had over the last uh, many months. So it is continuing, and 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 your uh, statements need to address that. Secondly. In light of the fact that it's continuing, I think you can expect that at least some of your constituencies will want to see a link between um, noting that this is continuing in a call for a ceasefire. And um, and and I think you have to have an answer to that. Um, and um, if, if, as many have uh, did in the early months of um, uh, Israel's assault on the Gaza Strip refused to um, embrace a ceasefire because it was seen as somehow um, emboldening or or giving comfort to Hamas. I think um, you've you know it may be a moment to reconsider that. Um, and while there may be a logic of um, treating these two issues separately, I think you need to understand that for. Um, the communities that you're working with, they'll be intertwined. And to address uh, the anniversary without calling for a ceasefire, I think will will hurt. Um, and the last thing that I, I, I want to note is that while um, I think there is a, um, a need to acknowledge um, and to share the pain of uh, folks on both sides and to um, uh, be unequivocal uh, on uh, in that respect. I, I also think that we have to, we shouldn't fail to understand some of the asymmetries that are in place right now. And there are asymmetries of power of the kind that Mira uh, pointed to earlier. Um, one very, very strong military, the strongest in the region, um, uh, compared to Hamas, which was a, a much smaller fighting force, and Hezbollah too, though it, it's more powerful. 
but um but but beyond the the asymmetry in power there's there's been an asymmetry with regard to consequences and I don't think this is a moment to sort of be comparing numbers because I don't think that that resonates with anyone and I don't think that I wouldn't recommend that folks get into that sort of story but I um I think that um we we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are um millions of people uh displaced from their homes and living um in tents out in the open uh in the Gaza strip and and now another million displaced from their homes in, in Lebanon. And while to be sure there are, are Israelis displaced um, too, um, and the Israelis experiencing something that's very difficult. Um, I think that as we're grappling with the reality here, we um, <laughs> at minimum, we should be prepared to, to um, anticipate that folks will raise questions about those issues, about those asymmetries. Thank you both uh, for for helping us with that. I know I think that's really helpful. Um, and, and many of us on the call will take that away to consider how we engage over the next uh, uh, couple of weeks. I have one more question um, for you both, and then we're going to open it up to uh, to the questions we received from the audience. My colleague Renatha will come to, to ask those. Um, I'm going to start with Mira on, on this question. Um, and I mean, I, I'm asking it. Mira, acknowledging that the immediate situation, this may be a weird one to answer considering what you're facing at the moment. And may I say it's weird moderating a panel with someone who's feeling directly under threat and I feel pretty helpless. I hope I hope nothing happens uh, anytime soon for sure. But where do you turn to for hope around this issue? I mean, I guess just looking at as I called it before, the ecosystem of groups working for uh, equality, working, knowing there is another way, um, knowing that we need to think about each other's humanity. Um, that's where I turn to for hope. And there's a particular group that I'd like to highlight that I'll get Omar to talk about because he is co-chair of the board. Go ahead, Omar. Uh, sure, thank you, Mira. Um, uh, for for um, uh, the last 10 years or so, there's um, been a, a gradually building movement called A Land for All or Two States, One Homeland. And um, uh, it is, Cameron, as you I noted in your, in your introduction, a, a, a movement that advocates a two-state solution but it's a very different kind of two-state solution than the one that was long on the table during the peace talks in which um, I participated in an earlier stage. Um, and it's a, it's a two-state solution built around um, a different set of values and a different framework. And so um, the, the uh, core idea is that Israel, uh, that alongside Israel, a Palestinian state uh, would be established. Um, that uh, that state's borders would be based on the June 4th, 1967 line, which is a line around which some international consensus has developed, and that it would have, um, uh, as would Israel, uh, sovereign authority and um, in completely independent sovereign authority in, in many areas, um, education, uh, taxation, uh, foreign affairs, to name a few. But, um, but whereas in the past, uh, the guiding principle that defined how a two-state solution would be structured was separation. Um, uh, us here, them there, in the words of one Israeli campaign slogan. Um, what a land for all recognizes is that even if two states are built, uh, are erect, even if a Palestinian state is erected alongside Israel, interdependence will remain necessarily the norm and needs to be accommodated, not only through an array of joint institutions um, addressing everything from climate change adaptation to transportation to um, economy, public health, things like that, um, but that also we would have a commitment to freedom of movement and freedom of residence 
gradually implemented over time with due regard, of course, for security of both peoples, um, for, for all Israelis and all Palestinians. And um, this framework of free movement and residence across this tiny country, which is in its entirety, including um, all of Israel-Palestine, is, and its entirety is only slightly larger than the state of Vermont, uh, you would, um, a, a Palestinian would be able to live anywhere and Israeli would be able to live anywhere. And that would help us to find solutions to issues that have long been obstacles, issues like what happens to the 700,000 Israeli settlers in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, uh, what happens to the millions of Palestinians who seek return to their homes in what's now Israel, um, and how we deal with shared places like the city of Jerusalem, uh, where there are both Palestinians and Israelis living there. So um, we may put into the chat a foreign affairs piece that was just published that speaks a little bit about um, this uh, vision. And you can also go online to a land for all's website and learn more. The, the only last thing I'd say is that, you know, although the movement has existed for a while, it kind of has become a more structured organization only fairly recently. And the board on which I sit uh, was created uh, in September and had its very first meeting on October 10th, 2023, three days obviously after the October 7th attacks. And, and that was incredibly important um, for us because um, while we could have encountered um, uh, acrimony around the Zoom call that day, um, it could have been it could have gone really badly. Instead, I think people shared sympathy and solidarity. And the reason for that was not so much that people had built a relationship with one another, though there was a little bit of that. It was also because this was an approach premised on values that both sides could really embrace, premised on mutual self-determination on the one hand, so that there is um, a state for each people, uh, but also on a genuine commitment to equality within, within each of those states and equality between the two states. And uh, that is a very, very different thing than the two-state solution that was long advocated. So please check it out. Right on. Thank you both. Thank you both for fielding those those many questions. We are going to go now and invite Renata in to, to join us um, on screen. We are going to go to audience questions, which I hear are starting to roll in. Um, if I may do a quick uh, int introduction to Renata, who, who runs the United for All initiative for us here at um, uh, United Way East Ontario. If I were going to answer a question about hope, um, it would be seeing what our community is trying to do together um, to figure out how to navigate this, to, to very deliberately and diligently and carefully support communities. So kudos to, to folks watching uh, um, uh, for all the work you're doing. Renata, take us through the first question. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Mira, Omar, so far for your insights, your valuable insights. We have a number of questions and we'll do our best to get through them. So I'll just begin here. Uh, the first question, well, we have one, two questions that I'm going to ask together. First is, how do you recommend we engage in dialogue with people who strongly believe that being against the actions of Israel during all of this means you are anti-Semitic? And to go along with that is, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on how allies to either community can engage in advocacy, protest, et cetera, while avoiding falling into the trap of anti-Semitism or anti-Palestinian racism that may be perpetrated by others in that space. Thank you, Mira, do you wanna start? Yeah, so some things to avoid, um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll say some things um, to avoid that could be construed as anti-Semitic when engaging in Palestine solidarity activism. And maybe Omar, you could say, if uh, an Israel advocacy rally was taking place, what could they do? Maybe the whole thing is fraught though, but I'll let you, I'll let you answer it in any way you want. Um, so in terms of Palestine solidarity rallies and campus protests, saying things like go back to where you came from, um, any Holocaust denial, any kind of, yeah, saying Jews are from Europe, Jews don't belong there um, because it delegitimizes people's homes. And that's exactly what 
how, what Jew, what many Zionists have done to Palestinians in terms of Nakba denial and the idea is we need to start, we don't want to have a race to the bottom. We want to start, um, we want to start as applicable or continue to honor everybody's dignity and rights. Um, so that's one thing I would say. And it's related to the other question, if I can, um, about uh, that I see an, a, a conversation or a debate about being Jewish, being a religious identity and not an ethnic group while being Palestinian as an ethnic group. So again, trying to delegitimize groups, I, um, self conceptions is I find also a little bit, um, well, hateful might be a bit strong, but delegitimizing. I mean, it's, it's the opposite of constructive, it's destructive. So um, to not say Jews, you're not a people, you're only a religion. Same for Jews to not say to Palestinians, you're not a people, there's 21 or however many, is, is, it, is it 21, is that the exact number? Roughly 21 Arab states, Palestinians can go anywhere. These kinds of things just serve to delegitimize. Again, race to the bottom, both sides do it. So to really start honoring people's self-conception, Jews seeing themselves as a people and a nation, Palestinians see themselves as a distinct nation. Um, that's what I would say for now. Oh, and you wanted me to ask about dialogue with people who strongly believe that being against the actions of Israel means you're anti-Semitic. Um, I think it's really important to clarify if you are criticizing Israel, that you're not doing any of those things that I just said, so it's related, and that Jews deserve self-determination just like Palestinians deserve self-determination. Now, neither side uh, has the right to determine themselves at the expense of the rights of the other. There are many ways to collectively build up and uphold the rights of both, both individually and collectively. And Omar's uh, just described a land for all as an organization that attempts to do just that, but that's not the only way to do that or, or advocate for that. Uh, what, what she said. <laughs> Well, okay. there are there things, Omar, that like if if, for example, if the Jewish community and I I, mean, I haven't seen because I'm away, so I'm not seeing what exactly is happening by the Jewish community on October 7th. But if there is a vigil or a rally or if there is a walk for Israel, what um, how would Palestine like I'd love to hear from you, Omar. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just now we haven't really talked about this per se. We talk a lot about the campus protests, but we don't actually talk a lot about Israel rallies. What would make that feel not harmful, hate, emotionally harmful to you? Um, it's a it's a really good question and one that I I, I definitely need to think more about. I I think that there are some things that are kind of low hanging fruit, and so I think um, messages about supporting troops um, or messages that are uh, one-sided in their um, uh, acknowledgement of, of suffering um, uh, would be really hurtful. So like, you know, uh, uh, where I stand with Israel is accompanied by uh, support for the IDF. I think during a period uh, where many Palestinians feel the IDF is engaged in a genocidal campaign uh, in the Gaza Strip, um, one that is uh, not only resulting in a lot of civilian life, but that seems intended to. Um, I think that uh, uh, evoking the IDF in that way would, would be, uh, you know, particularly hurtful. I think that, um, uh, The um, I think that the the reality right now is that um, we've gotten to a political space where um, even the flying of an Israeli flag at a time when all of this is occurring uh, can suggest support not just for Israel but for what Israel is doing in Gaza and Lebanon. And so the question is, to my mind, to what extent communities of this kind are prepared to, along the lines of what we were discussing earlier, clarify to say, um, uh, you know, we support the lives of Israeli civilians and peace for all um, to, uh, to specifically acknowledge what Palestinians are experiencing to, you know, go the added length of, um, 
of making the distinction, which um, which many have called for with regard to the slogan from the river to the sea. And so I don't know, it's a great question, which I'm gonna have to think more about, but um, I think uh, those are the overt and implicit uh, messages that I think I'd probably be want to be aware of. Okay, thank you both. I'm going to move on to the next question. Uh, do you think the action of organizations calling for a ceasefire can be seen as performative? Practically, it doesn't seem that an organization in the local service space would have any political sway to push forward that demand, but it sounds like there is still a desire to hear that. So I'll just add in, so how would uh, local organizations enter into this space authentically? Um, can I, Omar, I think you had said that and I'd love to hear you answer that. And I wanna just throw in one little thing to help you in your answer. I mean, not to help you, to actually make it a little more challenging. Um, and that, and then later maybe get to Shelby's question later because it partly connects. But there was a big um, brouhaha and Omar, you knew about it kind of as it was unfolding because I was sharing it with you in Ottawa when Capital Pride issued a statement with Palestine solidarity and condemning October 7th, uh, Hamas's horrible attacks and calling for hostage release and calling for ceasefire later on using the word genocide, but not in the initial statement, but lower down, they did. Um, and then a lot of the debate was saying Capital Pride shouldn't be issuing a statement. It's not in their mandate. And I think this is, I mean, I don't know if this question is simply saying it's not in our purview, we shouldn't be issuing statements because then we can just go down the road of statement after statement after statement. And I know Omar, you and I have talked about this in the context of um, Political of a private, the private sector, especially we've had some occasion to talk about it with some private sector folks. So, I mean, I'm pushing you to answer because I don't really want to have to answer. So I'm giving you the hard work. But these are these are the things I'm feeling that are challenging. So, um, I think there are there there is a, a range of different approaches that organizations can can um, think about. Um, Kenneth Stern, who used to head Human Rights Watch, um, has suggested that maybe organizations should stop making statements um, about anything that is not narrowly within their purview, that the statements of solidarity that became the norm um, over the last few years, particularly in the wake of the um, uh, Black Lives Movement, um, should should stop that um, uh, that they raise more questions than they answer. So, I think that there is a legitimate argument for saying, you know what, this is enmeshing many organizations in harder conversations um, about issues that are not central to their mandate that need to happen. So let's not go there. Um, I think that that would militate against a statement about October seventh at all, um, uh, not just about a ceasefire. Um, but uh, I think that that's an understandable and defensible position to my mind. I think when one sort of walks into the space of, of statements and saying, or we are sometimes making statements, we sometimes bring folks into our um, uh, space uh, by expressing solidarity with what they're doing, I think then that uh, requires organizations to grapple with what values they're based on. And, and, um, and I think sometimes, you know, Mira and I have found in our interactions that beginning with values then makes it easier for us to grapple with how to apply those values to a given set of facts. And I think that organizations, as hard as it can be, can maybe think about that through, through that lens and to um, sort of ask, okay, so that, so that this isn't, isn't a one-off. Um, Let's think about the kinds of values that are fundamental to us um, and the kinds of events that we are uh, going to engage with uh, so that this is a policy, not just a um, uh, such a singular event that it, it becomes impossible to, to grapple with. The last thing I'd say is, is that, you know, I, I, I think that some of the arguments about um, uh, 
about Israel being single, singled out in these circumstances or about um, failing to grapple with um, what's going on and uh, uh, with regard to China's treatment of the Uyghurs or the horrific um, uh, consequences of the war, the civil war in Sudan, or, or you, you need to fill in the blank. Um, to me, they, they uh, strike me as um, worthy of pushing back at, uh, because, I mean, I remember very, very vividly how many Ukrainian flags there were all over the place um, in uh, the summer after Russia first invaded Ukraine, and 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 they remain in many places to this day. I don't remember conversations about how can you put up a Ukrainian flag without a Tibetan one next to it. Um, uh, or for that matter, a Palestinian one next to it. Um, I think that people respond to circumstances in front of them, and and that um, I'm not. This isn't uh, urging hypocrisy, but people, I think, have a right to address um, situations individually, and I think people also need to express solidarity sometimes. I mean, um, I I know that. This is, I'm wandering into incredibly sensitive territory um, in, in saying this, but Mira and I um, went, visited Poland together recently and had occasion to uh, visit Auschwitz. Um, and there's so much one could say about that experience, which we could say for another time. But, um, you know, uh, so often, uh, since that time, people have asked the question, why didn't allies do something at that juncture? Um, why didn't they bomb Auschwitz when they had an opportunity to bomb it, knowing at least by the point that they did what was occurring there? Um, and um, and I think in a range of smaller ways, people ask why there wasn't greater solidarity with Jews through the 30s and into the 40s. Um, why there wasn't outrage at each and everything that happened, why there wasn't mobilization um, in other countries. Um, and so I think one of the things that we've got to grapple with is the fact that people here are trying to show solidarity in ways that might percolate up to governments um, to try to stop something that they feel is a crazy human tragedy of our era. And I, and I think that those conversation that those kinds of demands deserve better than a kind of what aboutism, um, which too often it characterizes the conversation. Okay, thank you both. I'm just gonna kind of stay on this a little bit. So it's a bit of this next question is a bit adjacent to the last question because um, the next question we've talked about a cap the capital pride situation and you know it is top of mind for a lot of participants here locally. So organizations pulled out stating that they did not they did so in order to keep their Jewish community members safe. So who speaks on behalf of local Jewish communities? How do we navigate internal divisions? of a particular community as outsiders trying to engage in dialogue? It's an excellent question. I must say, I personally was flabbergasted by the reaction, um, by the reaction of the Jewish community. And then not only the Jewish community, we know, I mean, some of you, your organizations might've pulled out. I haven't even canvas to see who I, I see your names in the chat but I don't see all your uh, affiliations but my own employer pulled out Carleton University so did Ottawa U um, so here's the deal with the Jewish community every major city in North America has an organization called the Jewish Federation of Ottawa and this may be a review like most of you probably know what I'm going to say but it's worth saying it anyway in case people don't fully know they have an organization called the Jewish Federation, Jewish Federation of, in this case, Ottawa, name your city, and there's one, usually, um, in any every major population center where there are Jews, which is generally every major population center in North America. Uh, it operates very much like the United Way. It's a organize, it's a it's a planning and allocations body. 
that then filters its money, the monies that it gets through an annual campaign, very similar to United Way, to its constituent uh, groups like kosher food bank, Jewish camps, Jewish homes for the aged, Jewish disability programs, Jewish child, Jewish family services, which I see is the rep is here. And some of those, many of those, uh, organiz some of those organizations also serve non-Jewish populations, J JFS, Fam Jewish Family Services being a prime example. Um, so in a sense, they, that there's an organ, there is an organizational structure that people give money and then the money gets distributed in these community in these organizational ways and so jewish federation has some credibility but this it we're not talking about an elected government we're not talking about a state we're not talking about even the a mayor um now to make things more complicated on the israel lobby there is something called center for israel and jewish affairs sija sija claims to be the voice of the canadian jewish community on uh, matters related to Israel and it, and it lobbies the government and in a sense it can claim that in a sense because when anybody donates to Jewish Federation just like donating to the United Way as a parallel as a metaphor anytime someone donates to the Jewish Federation in Canada money automatically goes to CJA not so in the US like if we think of CJA as a little bit like APAC in the US the Israel lobby there's no automatic um, siphoning off there's no automatic donation to APAC if you just want to donate to your local Jewish Federation. So CJA has a, in a sense, a right to say that they are the voice of the Jewish community. Um, rabbis and boards of synagogues, especially boards of synagogues, have the right, in a sense, to say that they are the voices of the Jewish community. But this is where it breaks down. People um, don't always agree with the statements and positions of the board of their synagogue or the statements and positions of the Jewish Federation or the statements and positions of Sija. And so what we need to do, and I feel really strongly about this, is if you are not part of the Jewish community and you're on this call and you want to engage with the Jewish community, I wouldn't I wouldn't say bypass all the leaders. I wouldn't because leaders put in a lot of time and they are effectively able to articulate the will of many but they don't articulate the will of all and they don't articulate the will of all the jews in ottawa who have who don't feel comfortable in those institutional settings for an array of reasons so it's really important to do to to engage with jewish communities on two levels one on the official level of board rabbi um president of, of particular Jewish organizations and ordinary people and that's where we need to spread out and we need to be involved in networks, whether they're social networks or cross cutting um, events like. Uh, uh, this is like bowling alone like back to Robert Putnam sports clubs bowling clubs. Um, um, tennis clubs bingo halls I don't know if we still have bingo halls in Ottawa, but if we do I could really use one right now to relax. Um, whatever it is if it's the pinball night at House of Targ, we need to be meeting and engaging with people beyond our communities and then get taking a temperature and seeing what's happening and then maybe creating some cross cutting groups in Ottawa that are for freedom and dignity for all. Well, oh, there anything to add there, or or has Mira covered it? Thanks. Okay, this is great. Thank you so much. Uh, we I'm going to try to ask two more questions. So the the first here is, can you address the Western media coverage over the past eleven months and how and its impact on bias and anti-Palestinian racism locally? Sure, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, I I can't uh, speak to this scientifically uh, because it's it's not my field. Um, so I'll, I'll speak to it as a, a consumer of media and um, make two points. The first point is that um, I think that the bias that uh, that as a Palestinian American, um, it has been very, very hard for me to see how uh, different uh, the coverage of suffering among Israeli Jews and the suffering among Palestinians, uh, particularly in the Gaza Strip, has been over the last year. And um, uh, I, um, I wish I could. I wish I could. Uh, 
offer up some examples of the kinds of things uh, that have kind of gotten my goat. There were periods uh, when there were, there were moments this last year when I would write to Amira and say, um, I can't believe this just happened. Um, and uh, and and so I, I really do think that um, the, uh, uh, the the media has, uh, as a general matter, uh, particularly uh, TV media, uh, done far less than it should to humanize Palestinians' experience. But I I will say that I have seen a market improvement compared to uh, past years in certain publications. Um, and um, as maligned as the New York Times has been, um, and to some extent for good reasons, just to cite one example, I think there's also been some really good uh, reporting there, a real attempt in that um, medium to uh, try to surface a range of different stories. And so I think um, what I uh, uh, am struck by is that uh, in this media universe that we occupy, there are places, and obviously not just the New York Times, publications um, like uh, 972, uh, which is a really excellent uh, Israeli-Palestinian publication that um, offers really uh, probing um, coverage of what's happening on the ground. Um, and uh, uh, Al Jazeera offers a range of perspectives one doesn't get very often in the uh, US, um, major US media. And so um, those help to provide, uh, to make a little bit of a dent in what has been a, uh, uh, a deeply frustrating situation. And even um, notwithstanding uh, the bias that you see in places like Fox News, um, what you do see is that uh, American, North American attitudes about um, the unfolding situation over the last year have evolved. And I think many, many people have gotten the story, whether it's through social media um, or it's through um, mainline channels. And that um, and that encourages me in, in some way. Great, thank you. Mira, did you have anything to add? Okay. Well, I mean, I would just say that when I go on uh, CBC radio uh, to give commentary, I get complaints from the, uh, you know, so-called Israel advocacy side. So there is a lot of, um, I, I don't know if if the answer as to which direction the media is biased in has been settled yet, um, but I guess I would urge people to read critically and see not only what's being said, but what isn't being said. And I think that's always really important. Absolutely, thank you for that. So I'm gonna ask the last question here. Um, in your efforts to bring together the Palestinian and Jewish communities, what has been the most transformative moment of empathy and understanding that you've witnessed? And how can these moments serve as a model for nonviolent resistance and unity in a deeply divided conflicts around the world? I mean, it's for me, it's, it's really probably just my um, research partnership and friendship with Omar, whose um, friendship is unwavering, who is there um, through talking through tough issues and knows when it's hard and knows um, when to just be there. I, I might do something similar. Um, you can't fully see it, but Mira has a tattoo on her arm. Um, and um, her tattoo, which she had uh, made some years ago, has... Um, an okay, Hebrew I'll letter. show it off. Twist my arm. <laughs> well, it has in Hebrew letters, as you can see on the top, the names of her, uh, the Hebrew names of her two kids. And um, for the last few years when we were doing research, um, the Arabic letters on the bottom didn't appear there. Um, 
And um, we had a dilemma because we knew we were going into uh, the West Bank and um, to Palestinian cities and that Palestinians not knowing what the Hebrew letters meant might think that Mira was projecting, you know, put, put a, a, a nationalist Israeli slogan or, or something worse on her arm um, and that that might be offensive to them or dangerous for Mira. Um, and, um, and so there were a range of ways that Mira could have responded to this situation from continuing to cover up her arm to refusing to go to those spaces. Um, but she completely surprised me the other day um, by doing what you can see here, which is writing um, her kids, the, the Arabic words representing the um, uh, names of her uh, kids, um, uh, the words for love um, and friendship. And uh, to me, it's such an extraordinary thing to do uh, because I can't see how anyone would look at that tattoo now uh, and see a threat in it. It's exactly the kind of context building that we were talking about with regard to the river to the sea slogan. Um, and uh, for her to do it in this moment um, uh, on her body um, and uh, choosing those words in particular, um, uh, to me, uh, means the world and sort of points to who she is as a person, but also, you know, what is possible, um, and, uh, uh, what is possible when, you know, there is a bit of love and friendship between people. So, um, so thank you for that beautiful question. Um, and also for my, uh, beautiful partner in this, uh, in this effort. Well, and a beautiful answer, actually. Uh, thanks for that, Omar and, and, and Mira. I think we will wrap things up now, um, but I'll invite you. Is there any, any final words that you want to share before we, before we do that? Mira? Just, um, I think, I just really wanted to, again, send appreciation to um, your team for organizing this and also for the service providers because you are really doing work that is really challenging and you're showing up and it's I think it's um, maybe not as recognized as it always needs to be so I hope you feel a bit of uh, recognition from us for thanking you for the work and that you're also able to take care of yourselves as well. For that, Omar? I just wanted to add my thanks to y'all for a really uh, wonderful conversation and for giving us the opportunity to speak to folks and and thank you for the all the work that you're doing for the many different communities you serve. Well, this has really been a fascinating couple of hours. So thank you for the time. I, I, I'm, I'm taking cues from your last answer, Omar, and trying to apply it to the at a community level. I think we we all would benefit from finding people in the community we can we can fight with respectfully, we can we can debate and learn from. I think it's important to send signals like your tattoo, Mira, uh, that uh, that you that you care and that you uh, empathize. And, um, you know, I think it's important to center, center emotion and and an understanding of what uh, what people are, are going through um, when we do our work. Um, I'll end it there. Kudos to the United Way and United for All teams for working in the background uh, and making this happen. Kudos to both of our panelists from joining from around the globe um, to, to share with us their expertise. Uh, and thank you so much to the, to the many, many people who, who showed up to listen and to ask questions. More to come, I'm sure, but this was, uh, this was a really, uh, really lovely uh, uh, place to spend some time uh, for a couple of hours. So thank you all.